Hi, this is chapter 25, DNA Metabolism. Okay, so this series of lectures um, cover three topics. Each topic is a single lecture. DNA replication, DNA repair, and DNA recombination. What is DNA metabolism? Okay, so DNA, while it provides a stable storage of genetic information, it's undergoing constant change. Um, so doing this, this change occurs during both replication and during transcription. And the entire process of replication and transcription are systems that have high fidelity, meaning that whenever errors occur during this process, or both of these process, processes, um, there are systems or there are mechanisms in place that find the error and correct the error via repairs. And we will talk about this in the next lecture. Um, in the third lecture, we'll talk about recombination where segments of DNA are rearranged either within a chromosome or between two DNA molecules that give rise to novel offsprings. Okay? Um, and DNA metabolism consists of a set of tightly regulated processes that achieve these tasks. Bacterial gene naming. This is the convention name used by geneticists to name genes in bacteria. So genes are named, are named using three lowercase italicized letters. For example, UVR. The name usually reflects a function. By function, I'm referring to a genetic function or a physiological observation. Um, UVR encodes genes for resistance to UV radiation. Capital letters are added to these three letter names in the order of their discovery, meaning a temporal order. So DNA, capital letter A, was discovered first, and DNA, capital letter B, was discovered second, and DNA, capital letter C, was discovered third, and so forth. However, this order of discovery need not be the order in which these genes carry out their functions in a genetic map, okay? So it's just a temporal indication of when the gene was discovered. And while this is convenient for describing things in a manuscript, it can give rise to problematic situations where um, in the future when you have many different names of many different DNA molecules, <clears throat> names meaning, for example, DNA A all the way to DNA D, and these, the order in which these uh, genes carry out their functions or these gene products carry out their functions are different than the order in which the names are given to them. Bacterial protein naming. Names are often done after their genes. They're non-italicized Roman type. The first letter is capitalized. For example, DNA A is the protein encoded by DNA A in the gene. So this top one is the protein name, and this bottom one is the gene name. Now, for example, you'll see for Drosophila, you'll see much more colorful names, and um, that is just a difference between the geneticists in the microbial geneticists and uh, Drosophila geneticists. Map of the E. coli chromosome. This map shows the relative positions of genes encoding many of the proteins important in DNA metabolism. The number of genes known to be involved provides a hint of the complexity of these processes. The number is 0 to 100 inside the circular chromosome denote a genetic measurement called minutes. That's shown here. So we're essentially looking at 100 minutes. Each minute corresponds to approximately 40 thousand base pairs along the DNA molecule. The three letter names of genes shown here, for example, MUT L, SSB, or UVRA, reflect some aspect of their function. These include MUT for mutagenesis, DNA for DNA replication, PAL for DNA polymerase, RPO for RNA polymerase, UVR, UV resistance, REC for recombination, DAM for DNA adenine methylation, leg for DNA ligase, and so forth, okay? And origin C is where the 
replication origin of E. coli begins. So every chromosome has a single replication origin, and we'll discuss what this means later on in this lecture. So a couple of notes about these names. Number one, the naming convention is not universal for all organisms, and they can vary within each species as well. So the name usually, not always, reflects genetic function. In yeast, gene names can typically have three uppercase italicized letters followed by a number. So that obviously creates some problems when non-geneticists are trying to understand what's going on and they're looking at homologous genes. Eupig eukaryotic proteins have different naming conventions. They're complex and they also vary within each species. And they may have the same name as the gene, but the case of the letters is different. So again, additional complexity is created because a single um, Mechan a single may way for naming uh, genes was not initially established, and many different scientists went different paths for uh, naming genes and their associated proteins. Here is a chemical depiction of what a single-stranded DNA looks like. At one end, you have a phosphate group on carbon number five of your uh, furanose backbone. And the other end, you have a hydroxyl and the carbon number three of the ribose backbone. And coming off carbon number ones are your bases. That's shown here. And obviously, on the opposite side of this, you have another complementary single-stranded DNA, where at, up here you would have a three prime OH, and down here, you'd have a five prime OH, okay? So double-stranded DNA, you have five prime end where there's a phosphate. On the complementary end side, you have a three prime hydroxyl. And at the opposite end, you have a three prime hydroxyl on one side, on one strand, and a five prime, I'm sorry, this should have been a phosphate on the other end. One of the early questions about DNA replication was, is it a, does it follow a conservative model or a semi-conservative model? So in the conservative model or hypotheses, you have a double-stranded DNA shown here as two complementary circular dark lines where each one is being made a copy of. So at the end, you have four uh, single four strands of DNA, and both strands go to one daughter, shown here, and then the copies that are synthesized of the strands go to a second daughter, shown here. So remember, one cell divides into two, a parent cell divides into two daughter cells. In the conservative model, one daughter gets both cop both original strands of DNA, and the second daughter gets the copies of those strands. In the semi-conservative model, you have the same initial point where a parent has two complementary strands of DNA. However, in this case, the um, one daughter receives one copy of the original or receives the original and a copy of that original shown here in blue. And the second daughter gets the second strand from the parent, the second original strand, and a copy of that original strand shown here in blue. Okay, so two different models, and how did we figure out which model does the cell divide following? Does it use a conservative or a semi-conservative model? This question was answered by a set of experiments by Messelson and Stahl. And in this series of experiments, they used, they took advantage of the fact that E. coli can incorporate um, nitrogen into their DNA. And this is something we discussed in the last set of lectures. So what they did was they grew E. coli in the presence of glucose and ammonium chloride, where the ammonium 
uses N15. So this is called heavy nitrogen. So when you grow E. coli in the presence of this, all the um, molecules that have nitrogen are going to have N15 nitrogen. So they grew the E. coli, they purified the genome, and they ran it on a cesium chloride density gradient. This is the isopicnic uh, centrifugation that we discussed very early in the course. And when they did this, they were able to identify a band shown here, and this is called heavy, okay? Then they took the remaining cells and they grew them in regular media or media that contains N14. And they allowed the cells to divide a single time. Again, they purified the genome from some of these cells, ran them on the cesium chloride density gradient, and this time they were able to identify a single band that migrated at a higher position than what they saw with the heavy DNA. So this is where the heavy DNA is and this is where the new DNA is, okay? And then they took these cells, the remaining cells, and they put it back into N14 media, and they allowed it to grow for another cycle. And now they saw two bands on the cesium uh, chloride density gradient. One, again, shown here, that migrates identically to what they saw in image number B shown here. And they saw a new band that migrated slower or near the top of the gradient that's shown here in this, like this red disk. And they interpreted the data as follows. So at the very top, they identified this as heavy, meaning it contained N15 uh, labeled nucleotides. This medium band is the hybrid DNA. This contains both N15 and N14. That's why it migrates slowly. And this contains the number in part C. You have both the hybrid DNA that is, contains both N14 and 15 in the DNA, and light DNA that contains only N14 DNA. Okay? So this suggested that what we're looking at is we're looking at the semi conservative model because both strands, after one cycle of division, you do not see two strands of two or two bands of DNA. You don't see a heavy and a hybrid. You only see the hybrid, meaning one strand gets the N15 and the second strand gets the N14. So this is the N15 shown in cyan, and this is the N14. And only this explanation, where you have both an N15 and an N14, can describe what you're seeing experimentally. And as you allow the cells to divide more, you will see one set that is composed only of N14 because you only have N14 in your media at this point, and some of the parent that contains both, um, or the, the, the result of experiment B where you have a set of cells that have both the hybrid, that have both the N14 and the N15 that's shown. Here's a quick review of semi-conservative replication from chapter eight. The idea is that the pre-existing or parent strand shown in here in blue is separated and copied each strand into the pink shown here daughter strand. So you have the two complementary strands here is copied over to generate two additional double-stranded DNA where a parent strand has a complementary daughter strand. Replication of circular double-stranded DNA. So on the right-hand side, we're looking at some results from some initial experiments that gave us some idea into how replication of double-stranded DNA occurred. What you're looking at are genomic material from E. coli that have been purified and visualized using um, electron microscopy. So the 
figure on the left is a cartoon interpretation of what you see on the right. So this is cartoon on the left, and on the right is your um, is your experimental data. And what the authors did was they purified the genome. They looked at it with um, EM. We don't need to worry about how that works, but they're seeing a couple of different structures. In the top, what you're seeing is you're seeing a circular entity, and within that is a what appears to be a bubble. And then in the next image, you see what appears to be two bubbles that are connected to one another. And what you see on the bottom right are two bubbles that seem to be of about the same side, size, and they're still connected to one another. So the one assumption that was made in these series of experiments is that one, you are looking at E. coli genomic material, and two, that this, what we're looking at, are we looking at early events at the very top, intermediate events in the middle, and late events at the very end of genome replication. And what's happening is that a initial bubble forms. This gives rise to two replication forks, and these replication forks continue to get to progress one in the left hand going counterclockwise and the other going clockwise, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go from top to the bottom. And that's interpreted as these figures on the left-hand side. As you can see, the replication forks are getting bigger and, and are, are going in opposite directions and um, getting bigger and bigger until they meet one another and you have two daughter duplexes being formed. So these were assumptions in this set of experiments. However, additional experiments performed later on supported this and demonstrated that replication begins at a single site and progresses until two daughter duplexes are generated. DNA replication involves multiple steps. There's an initiation step where a primer is required. There's elongation where the DNA is extended. The extension occurs from the primer. And there's a termination where the elongation ends. An additional step is ligation, where multiple small pieces of DNA are ligated to it together to make a longer piece of DNA. And again, remember, this entire process involves copying a complementary strand referred to as the parent strand, and the copy is referred to as the daughter strand. Here we are looking at one end of the replication bubble. The replication fork is moving from left to right, where the parent double-stranded DNA, shown in blue, is being separated by a helicase, not shown in this image, and complementary DNA strands are being made. These are colored in pink. Again, double-stranded DNA has directionality with a 5' phosphate and a 3' hydroxyl. The new DNA strand, shown in pink, is always synthesized in the 5' to 3' direction. The template is read in the opposite direction. That is from the 3' end to the 5' end. The leading strand is continuously synthesized in the direction take, taken by the replication fork. The other strand, the lagging strand, is synthesized discontinuously in short pieces in a direction opposite to that in which the replication fork moves. These short strands of DNA are called Okazaki fragments. The Okazaki fragments are connected together by DNA ligase in bacteria Okazaki fragments are about 1,000 to 2,000 nucleotides long, whereas in eukaryotes, they're 150 to 200 nucleotides long. So, again, you have a 5' prime phosphate end and a 3' prime hydroxyl end on the parent DNA. The direction of replication fork is in this direction, going from left to right. As you go from left to right, the leading strand that is being synthesized is synthesized from 5' prime to 3', prime, and that's being read from the complementary strand, which goes from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Again, 3' prime to 5'. Prime. The opposite strand is called the lagging strand. 
So the lagging strand is also read from three prime to five prime. However, because of the way this works, you cannot synthesize one long continuous piece of DNA. And we'll talk about this in more detail later on. Therefore, you get many short pieces of DNA. And you get, and again, in E. coli, these are about 1,000 to 2,000 nucleates long, these Okazaki fragments. And in eukaryotes, they are 150 to 200 nucleotides long. Parental DNA strands serve as a template. Nuclei, nucleoside triphosphate serve as substrates. So these are your substrates shown here on the bottom right. And the new nucleophilic OH group at the three prime end of the growing chain attacks the alpha phosphate of the incoming nucleoside. So this is the three prime OH shown up here. And this attacks the phosphate of the substrate shown here. It's actually attacking this phosphate. Okay, no, I'm sorry. So attacking this phosphate shown here. The very, the, 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 this is your where your base is, and it's the alpha phosphate that's being attached. Attack. This attack releases a pyrophosphate that's shown here, which is a good leaving group. This pyrophosphate ultimately hydrolyzes to two inorganic phosphates and releases energy. This second hydrolysis also helps drive the reaction towards synthesizing the DNA, which is a polymer. Here is a link at the bottom for a YouTube video that shows a computer animation of this process. I strongly recommend that you put this into your computer and go and watch the video to get a better understanding of what's going on. DNA is synthesized by DNA polymerases. Cells have multiple DNA polymerases. These polymerases have different numbers of subunits, different capabilities, and are under different types of regulation. For the time being, we're talking about DNA polymerase one. DNA polymerase one also has activity that requires a single unpaired strand of DNA to act as a template and a primer strand, which could be either DNA or RNA to provide the free hydroxyl group at the three prime end. To this free hydroxyl group are added new nucleotides one at a time. The DNA polymerase has two important sites, an insertion and a post-insertion site. In the insertion site, each incoming nucleotide is selected in part by base pairing to the appropriate nucleotide in the template strand. The reaction product has, new, has a new free prime, new free three prime hydroxyl group. This allows the addition of another nucleotide. The newly formed base pair migrates to the post insertion site to open the polymerase insertion site for the addition of another nucleotide. So, we have our template strand shown here. It's read from three prime to five prime. We have a primer strand shown here. This again could be either DNA or RNA, and it's synthesized from five prime to three prime. The three prime hydroxyl end of the primer, which is freely available, is necessary for the incoming DNTP, where N can be either A T, G, or C to form a covalent bond. This initial interaction between the nucleotide and the template strand occurs in the insertion site of DNA polymerase 1. A covalent bond is made here, and the entire DNA polymerase 1 translates one nucleotide over. And you can see here is the covalent bond is made, and the translocation occurs here, and the AT, which was complemented in the first step, is now in the post-insertion site of the polymerase. That leaves the insertion site, shown here, free to interact with an incoming DNTP. Here is a slightly more detailed view of the DNA polymerase 1 from Thermos aquaticus. The structure can be described as a hand with three domains a palm where the DNA binds, the thumb, and fingers. The three domains wrap around the DNA, and the figure on the left is a surface representation with the three domains colored. The insertion and post-insertion sites are between the three domains and colored in gray. Again, the insertion site is where the nucleotide addition occurs, 
and the post-insertion site is where the newly formed base migrates after it appears. Polymerases extend polymers one unit at a time, but sometimes they release the polymer or dissociate from the polymer. The number of nucleotides added before dissociation is called processivity. The processivity of different polymerases vary widely from a nucleotides to many from few nucleotides to many thousands. Each specific polymerase has its own processivity and polymerization rate. Remember that all these rates are limited by the rate of diffusion. While DNA, RNA, and proteins are called biopolymers, these polymers do not fit the definition of polymers you've learned in organic chemistry because the repeating units of these biopolymers are not identical to one another. For example, in DNA, the units of the polymer are A, G, C, or T. In RNA, they are A, G, C, or U. And in proteins, they are one of the 20 amino acids. Because the units are different, there can be errors when the polymer is extended. For example, DNA pol 1 can add a G when it should have added a C. Thus, polymerases have error corrections to check and correct for this type of mistake. Errors in E. coli are one in every 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 nucleotides, which is one every 1,000 to 10,000 replication events. The DNA polymerase active site tries to exclude base pairs with incorrect geometry. However, the wrong piece of nucleotide is inserted every 10,000 or 100,000 insertions. In these situations, there is a repair mechanism that removes the nucleotide and replaces it with the correct nucleotide. The standard AT and GC base pairs have very similar geometries, and the active site of DNA polymerases is sized to fit both of these base pairs. On the left-hand side, you can see how the shape of the active site for DNA polymerase accommodates both binding of GC on top and AT on bottom. However, the active site does not allow the fitting of TG, CA, or AG base pairs. So this line that I'm tracing right now defines the active site of DNA polymerase 1. Obviously, the active site is defined by the atomic coordinates in the protein. And as you can see, CG fit snug, snugly in there, as does TA. However, the T over here, there's a clash between the methyl and the carbonyl in the T and the active site and the atoms that define the active site of the polymerase. Again, there's a clash here for A, and there's a clash here as well. So the active site of DNA polymerase 1, as it does for all enzymes, defines what type of substrates can bind to the protein. Mechanism of DNA polymerases. The catalytic mechanism of nucleotides being added by DNA polymerase involves two magnesium ions coordinated to the phosphate groups of the incoming nucleotide triphosphate. Here are the magnesium ions. One is up here, two is down here, and the incoming DNTP is shown here. I'm tracing it with the pen.
This is the three prime hydroxyl of the growing strand of DNA. These aspartic acid residues are also important for catalysis. The three prime hydroxyl attacks the alpha phosphate of the incoming DNTP. The magnesium ion at the very top facilitates attack of this three prime hydroxyl group on the alpha phosphate of the nucleotide, whereas the other magnesium shown here at the bottom facilitates displacement of the pyrophosphate. That's this chemical entity over here. Again, remember this pyrophosphate further hydrolyzes to two inorganic phosphates. Both magnesium ions stabilize the structure of the pentavalent transition state. RNA polymerases use a similar mechanism for elongating RNA. Before we dive into the error correction of DNA polymerase 1, let's do a quick review. Nucleases digest nucleic acid, DNases degrade DNA, and RNases degrade RNA. Exonucleases cleave bonds at the ends of DNA or RNA, either at the 3' end or at the 5' end, and they do not have specificity. Whereas endonucleases cleave bonds within a DNA sequence, and these do have specificity. Structural analysis of DNA polymerase 1 has located the exonuclease activity behind the polymerase activity as the enzyme is oriented in its movement along the DNA. A mismatched base, here a CT mismatch, impedes translocation of DNA polymerase 1 to the next site. The DNA bound to the enzyme slides backwards into the exonuclease site, and the enzyme corrects the mistake which is 3' to 5' exonuclease activity. The enzyme then reassumes its polymerase activity in the direction of 5' to 3'. Okay, so recap. Here is DNA polymerase 1. This is the insertion site. This is the post-insertion site. This is the exonuclease site. And we are moving in this direction, from left to right. Here, there's a mismatch between a C and a T. When this happens, this does not fit into the active site of the enzyme properly, so the enzyme needs to correct this. What the enzyme does is it rotates. As you can see here, we've rotated from this direction in the top left to the direction shown here. And now this C is located to where the exonuclease site is present. The C is digested. The phosphodiester bond between G and C is digested, and DCMP is released from the active site. The enzyme then rotates back counterclockwise to the initial orientation shown here uh, in uh, number four. And now the insertion site is empty again. And now a DATP, which forms a correct complementary pair with T shown here, binds to the insertion site and the enzyme can continue with uh, DNA polymerization. There are at least five DNA polymerases in E. coli. DNA polymerase 1 is abundant, but it is not ideal for application. It has a rate, a polymerization rate, of about 600 nucleotides per minute, and is slower than observed for replication fork movement. It has low processivity, and it primarily func functions in cleanup. DNA polymerase 3 is the principal replication polymerase. DNA polymerases 2, 4, and 5 are involved in DNA repair. The genes coding for these enzymes are different. The molecular weight of the enzymes are different. The number of subunits in the enzyme are different. Some have 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. DNA polymerase 1 has 3' prime to 5' prime and 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity. These polymerases have different polymerization rates that vary from one nucleotide per second to 1,000 nucleotides per second, and they also have different processivity that varies from one to more than 500,000. Arrangement of sequence in the E. coli replication origin, OREC. The OREC site is 245 base pairs in length. It contains highly conserved sequence elements. There are five repeats of a nine base pair sequence R site. They are here R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. These form binding sites for the initiator protein DNA A. 
there is an AT rich region here in the far left that's referred to as the DNA unwinding element. The reason why this is called DNA unwinding element is because of the high numbers of A and T base pairs in this region. There is less energy is required to separate these strands of DNA, and this is where the initial separation of DNA occurs. These I sites are additional DNAA binding sites. DNAA only binds to these sites in the presence of ATP. IHF is the integration host factor, and FIS is the factor for inversion stimulation. N, shown here, represents any of the four nucleotides. The horizontal arrows, I'm highlighting with the pen, represent sequences in the top strand, where the arrows that are going from right to left denote sequences in the bottom strand. Initiation of replication in E. coli requires at least 10 different proteins. We'll talk about this in the next slide. The goal of this process is to open the DNA helix and form the pre-priming complex. DNA replication in E. coli requires over 20 enzymes and proteins. The set is called the replisome. It includes helicases responsible for ATP to unwind or separate DNA strands, topoisomerases responsible for relieving the stress caused by unwinding, DNA binding proteins that stabilize the separated strands, primases to make RNA primers, and DNA lycases to seal NICs between successive nucleotides of Okazaki fragments. Here is a model for initiation of replication at the E. coli origin, OREC. Eight ATP-bound DNA A proteins bind at the R and I sites in the origin. This was shown in the last slide. So these are the eight DNA A proteins. This binding causes the double-stranded DNA to form a right-handed helical structure and places pressure on the DNA unwinding element that is shown here. So remember, this is the highly rich, this is the high AT rich region. This strain causes the weak AT rich region, it's weak because there's only two hydrogen bonds between the A and the T, it causes the region to be denatured and the two single-stranded DNAs are formed. So you go from a double-stranded DNA to two single-stranded DNA. This is the, initiate, the initiation point of uh, the replication fork that you saw earlier. To the single-stranded DNA at the DNA unwinding element, shown here by the arrow, binds hexamer of DNA B. Here's DNA B, it has a C terminal domain and it has an N terminal domain. DNA B is a helicase and responsible for hydrolyzing ATP to unwind the double stranded DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So one set sits on this strand and another set sits on this strand, and the two go in opposite directions, both going in a 5' prime to a 3' prime direction. Other proteins like DNA polymerase 3, which is not shown here, link to DNA B, and others like single-stranded DNA binding proteins, or SSB, again not shown here, are responsible for stabilizing the separated DNA strands, or the separated SS DNA strands. A DNA gyrase sits at the front of the replication fork, shown here by, my, uh, by the circle, and this is responsible for relieving the topological stress that is created by the DNA unwinding of DNA B. Here is a cartoon showing replication at one of the replication forks. Remember that there's a second fork to the right of this image. Replication fork is moving to the left. There is a DNA gyrus at the very front, shown here. The template is read from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. We discussed this in the past, and DNA is synthesized from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. The hexameric helicase DNA B sits closest to the double-stranded DNA on the lagging strand 
and uses ATP hydrolysis to open the double-stranded DNA to form single-stranded DNA. A primase creates an RNA primer that is extended by DNA polymerase 3. So this is the RNA primer, and this is extended by DNA polymerase 3. The DNA polymerization is continuous on the leading strand. However, it is discontinuous in the lagging strand. Synthesis at the lagging strand causes single-stranded DNA to become present. Single-stranded DNA binding protein, or SSP, binds to the SSDNA to stabilize it. In figure D, we're looking at the process discussed in figures A through C, but we're seeing that it looks a bit more complicated. In fact, the entire process is coordinated, and we'll talk about this in the next series of slides. There is a fantastic YouTube video that summarizes the entire process, shown here. So, in summary, elongation of the leading strand is straightforward. DNA G, a primase, makes RNA primers that are 6, 10 to 60 nucleotides. DNA polymerase 3 adds nucleotides to the 3' prime end of this RNA to synthesize DNA at a rate of 1,000 to 2,000 nucleotides per second. For the elongation of the lagging strand, the same primase makes RNA primer and DNA polymerase 3 adds nucleotides to it. This strand is elongated away from the replication form. However, this DNA polymerase 3 is part of the same complex as DNA B, the primase, and the second DNA polymerase 3. That's shown here in figure D. So it can't venture too far away from it. Also, as the new lagging strand template is made available, new primers are needed to be synthesized and more Okazagi fragments are generated. The replosome, DNA synthesis on the leading and lagging strands. This set of images describes the mechanism of genome replication. Events at the replication fork are coordinated by a single DNA polymerase 3 dimer in an integrated complex with DNA, DNA B helicase. The lagging strand is looped so the DNA synthesis proceeds steadily on both the leading and lagging strand templates at the same time. Red arrows indicate the three prime end of the two new strands and the direction of DNA synthesis. Okazaki fragments are synthesized on the lagging strand. RNA primers are moved by DNA polymerase 1 or RNase H1. DNA polymerase 1 fills in the gap and DNA ligase seals the backward. 